the, the crux with ChatGPT and, and similar things is like you might just want to type in uh, you know a question and, and it gives you an answer. And you're going to assume that that's the answer at face value. So I think like right now it's a, the ability to critically think through the answers that large language models provide you. I think that's going to be actually more important as a data scientist. Your job essentially is to be a critical thinker about your business and about your organization's problems as a data scientist. To me, that's the fundamental core of that field. Suddenly you have many definitions of a customer. Is a customer that some, has bought ever from you? Is a customer that some, is somebody that bought in the last 90 days, last six months, last week? Is it a prospect, right? What's a customer? I think it's, a, it's a, so defining uh, these, these things too, like what's a sale? Writing a book on the other hand means you're, you know, you're, you're right, having to write many, many articles, but having to tie all those ideas together over, a, a, you know, sequentially throughout a book. And this is where I think a book is much, much different than writing a series of articles that so you have to keep a coherent thought, a coherent thread through the self-learning. If I see people, you know, as, as, as somebody who's hired, hired people, I mean, if I see, if I see people who are self-learning, self-motivated, who are just going out there and busting their butt and showing up, you know, to meetups and events where, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, interact and they're, they're interacting with practitioners and trying to grow those skills. I, I know that person has motivation. You know, I've hired people like that before I hired, you know, so your data is going to be limited. Yeah. Cause you don't have a lot of, you probably don't have a lot of interactions with your application yet. Right. So one thing I'm a big fan of is just uh, doing scenarios and spreadsheets, keeping it pretty low fidelity. So make fake data, make up scenarios and scenario plans say, okay, according to these scenarios, this is the expected outcome. Okay. So we'll start. This decade has witnessed a tremendous boom in data science and analytics. Whether you are an entrepreneur launching your startup or someone deeply passionate about delving into the realm of data, having a solid foundation is data science is a big deal. But let's not get into all the school stuff that what you can do with data science right now because there are plenty of videos out there on YouTube talking about those stuff. And it is also important to note that a significant amount of these resources are simply trash, leaving you with zero valuable insight into the true demands of the market and how to adequately prepare for the future. Now you know, apart from the folks of uh, doing data science and number crunching, there are another group of people who make sure that everything should run smoothly in the world of data, and those are called as data engineers. Today, we are going to talk about exactly what data engineering is. And if you're excited to start learning about it, then how and where to get started from it? To answer the first question, one can think data engineering is a part, is that branch of data science, which is all about making sure that data that is being collected should stored and analyzed smoothly. Data engineers build and look after the systems that handle big loads of data really well. Data engineering is like uh, you can think in a lemon terms if I say that it is simply building a system of pipes and these pipes take in different kinds of data, clean it up and get it ready for analysis. Well, to be honest, it is also not possible for me to delve further into technical details because my knowledge about this field is also very limited, okay? But we have a very special guest with us today who is the best-selling author of data engineering and he's an instructor of deeplearning.ai. He will share far more valuable insights about this topic and the most exciting part of this discussion is he'll also provide valuable advice to you if you are the person waiting to start your career or if you want to planning to switch your career in this direction. Okay, so without any further ado, let us begin our production. Welcome, Professor Joseph. It's really an exciting opportunity to have a discussion with you today. Cool. So too. we will be definitely covering topics and I hope it's going to be really interesting for our viewers as well. And, we'll uh, find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. 
and definitely we are also looking forward to hearing your insightful thoughts so starting with as uh, as i see that you have a very diverse background so ranging from opening your own company you have worked as an entrepreneur to working as a software developer and then you become a best selling author and now holding as an instructor at deeplearning.ai so could you share your experiences and uh, shed light that uh, what motivates you to embrace such a diversified career path especially when many individuals used to tend to settle in to one or ma- at max two specific domain uh i think it's probably more of a personality trait or a flaw <laughs> to be to be blunt uh i've never been the kind of person who's been able to uh Uh, sit still in one area or another. I think that I've consistently had some form of, uh, I guess, working with data in, in some capacity, but it's, you know, but it, it's always uh, varied uh, over time. But yeah, I would say the theme to my career is or it, it actually makes no sense whatsoever if you look at it. So, but it makes sense in the past, I guess. But at the time, you're just like, I don't know, but no idea what's, what the point is. I think that's something maybe they, um, you know, your listeners could take away is that there's, There's a lot of people that will tell you you need to stick with the path here, stick with the safe path. You know, prescribe a lot of um options for you, but you know, I think as at least my experience is illustrated, you know, for better or for worse, there, there's definitely more than one way to do things and there might be multiple ways to do things. And uh there's there's many ways of success, I would say, and probably many ways of failure too, but uh you know, the way I've always approached things is, you know, keep an open mind and be open to new opportunities and new possibilities and I kind of treat it like surfing or something like that where it's it's more uh um you know you just you know you just you, you kind of know what's on the horizon you 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 know maybe maybe that seems interesting and you want to go check that out and so I guess I've always been more of a kind of a you know following uh that mindset or or approach really I don't know if it's a path necessarily because it, it it would you know it's more of a uh Uh, I think it's more of a lack of a of a coherent path, but at least for me, it, it worked out really well. Um, I can't say it's for everybody. I think a lot of people's parents would probably look at you crazy too. I, I also grew up in a household where I didn't have a lot of restrictions, and nobody told me what to do. So I think that's a big part of it. So <laughs> I was able to make up my own mind about what I wanted to do and make my own mistakes early on. And so I think that that's uh, probably a big big piece of that. So your motivation was to stick. I mean, you have just uh, developed the idea of the data engineering while you have ten. I mean, you have started as a career from yeah. as an entrepreneurship. Then you have worked as a s- yeah. software developer. Yeah, I would say you know it, it's about. Uh, oh, sorry, was there a question behind that? So I'm just asking that uh, as you have a. I mean, you have worked on this diversified, so you have gained lots of knowledge yeah. about I mean, by, data by accident. engineering. A lot of it by accident, I would say. Like when I, you know, throughout, I mean, so I got started in, in data, I would say back when I was still studying mathematics, right? And, and back in the day, your, your career options were to become an actuary, which I was, you know, planning on doing or, you know, going to some sort of analysis or what else was the, the career field back then? You could go teach math, I guess. You can go uh, wait tables at a restaurant or something like that or go for the government, but there were more a lot, a lot of options back then to be fair. Right. It was not like it is now where data is like a sexy thing back then. It was like the thing you got into because I, uh, you're kind of weird. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? So, you know, but I think through those experiences, you know, you got to remember back in the day, like you didn't have all the fancy tools you have now. You didn't have all the practices, even that, you know, you had a lot of practices, but not a, you know, not quote modern practices or tooling. So, Uh, you live in an era of constraints versus an era of abundance, which you do now. But I would say the common theme that I've always noticed is that uh, working with data requires systems, you know, and it requires um, building a, a foundation of, you know, good architecture and, and quality data and useful data and believable data. And that never changed. But I, I think that data engineering was one of the things where I think it, it, I got into it because of necessity, right? Like I was trying to do a job either as um, you know, an analyst, a data scientist, or even a software engineer, you know, applying data to, to use cases. And, and time and time over, I kept seeing that, you know, the job I was hired to do often entailed, uh, you know, what data engineering, I guess, eventually became, which was um, you know, sort of managing that data engineering life cycle, which, I, you know, Matt, and I, Matt Housley and I came up with our co-author, but it was just the, uh, 
the notion that, you know, at the end of the day, you're sort of sitting at the intersection between uh, systems of record and, and applications of data use cases, right? So analytics, machine learning, so forth. And so you're, you're, um, you're, you're helping to manage that framework. But as a, maybe as a data scientist, for example, you're, you're implicitly managing that. I mean, the old trope is that data scientists spend 80%, 90% of their time getting and cleaning data, right? Which I thought was like a huge, um, a huge waste of time for most data scientists. Like, why is it that you're doing exactly the thing that you were trained not to do? But you're spending all your time doing it. I think that's a huge disservice. And um, you now, but if you dig underneath that, it's because the practices of data engineering weren't well established in a lot of companies, right? And so, you know, so that's so I, I would say that I, you know, I got into, I mean, I was practicing data engineering, I guess, before it wasn't officially a, a thing, like a lot of people were back in the you know, the late 2000s, early 2010s, but but now it's a field, and now now we can talk about data engineering as a, as a, as a real thing. So. I guess it's kind of cool. So how much change have you seen from 2010 to 2024? I would say the change is, the, the, the amount of change I've seen has been, well, it's, I think there's two sides to this, right? So there's like, there's the change that you see because um, tooling and uh, more people are in the space. I think that's a function of data science becoming the sexiest job of the 21st century. And all of a sudden, like everybody in their grandmother wants to be a, a data scientist and be in, in data because it's the hot thing. Companies started taking data a lot more seriously. So that, that follows in the Yale Economist article from, what was it, the mid-2010s? I can't remember the year, 2015 maybe. You know, data is new oil, right? So you have data is the sexiest job in the 21st century. Data is new oil. And, um, you know, and suddenly there's a lot of fear of missing out, FOMO, in, in data. And what that means is, um, um, you know, you have to be doing it for its own sake, right? So I think that what this what this caused and at the same time you had the modern you know quote modern data stack cloud big data all these other technological movements um that were happening and that that ushered in i think a, a called a sort of a golden era of tooling um so i would say that you know there's more people in data that's a big change data became more popular and more um seriously uh um uh considered at companies and an approach and that's that's another big thing you start seeing data you know quote creating more value for companies uh, move from basically an internal uh, facing IT function to something that would eventually power some businesses, uh, maybe the, running the core of their businesses in the case of companies like Amazon, Google, Uber, and so forth. Um, great tooling, right? So that's another big change. Um, you know, um, you know the democratization of, um, you know, I don't say democratization, but the you know, ability to use a, a wide range of tools from open source to paid SaaS uh, in the cloud was a game changing thing. So now anyone could operate at the at the scale that companies used to operate in uh and sophistication back in maybe the you know the 90s and 2000s when you had very expensive on-prem hardware you'd have to purchase and software and so forth so that was a, that was a game-changing thing right like, like the again the ability to, to use tools were open to the public at the same time uh practices evolved so you had machine learning practices moving from academia uh into uh, widespread use right to the point where you have auto ml and you have uh you know uh, i think probably there's a, there's a there's probably a data science boot camp for every man, woman, and child in this, in this earth right now. Um, and, uh, you know, no shortage of tutorials and, you know, and stuff. So knowledge opened up as well. That's a big thing, right? You used to have to buy books and uh, learn, the, learn kind of the hard way and learn through mentorship and so forth. Now, the ability to learn data is open to everybody, including you know, podcasts like, like yourself and so forth. So that, that's the thing I've noticed as well as the availability of um, knowledge is everywhere. At the same time, I would say it, it's interesting. I was talking about this with a friend the other day where I felt like um, we have the ability to, to probably deliver more quickly. At the same time, I could make an argument that the quality of the stuff we're, we're delivering has actually declined. Um, and part of this is because of the need to probably do faster delivery through agile and other practices. Um, and companies are moving a lot faster. And so you know, I would say practices that were traditionally done by data people like data modeling, for example, that's sort of fallen by the wayside. I think it's, again, starting to get a lot more um, attention precisely because of the impacts of ignoring it uh, or causing companies. But uh, so there's some of the changes. I think net net uh, data became uh, popular and uh, became a force into itself on like the old days when it was sort of a back office operation that nobody really cared about. So. Thanks, Professor, for sharing this. So I guess that your uh, diverse experience contributes to your success as a data science author. So could you share that when and how you realized to 
I mean, the need to write a books? Um, I think it's always been in the back of my mind to write a book. I think everybody wants to write a book at some point, right? I, 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 at least people I talk to. Maybe I just talk to a bunch of weird people. I don't know. Um, but I think that the notion of writing a book is one of these things where you feel like it, it's, an, it's, it's a chance for you to encapsulate a lot of your knowledge, um, you know, into something that's very permanent and very concrete. At least as permanent books can be these days. Eh? Physical books are a bit more permanent. But why did I want to write a book on data engineering? I, I felt like the books that I had seen on data engineering were okay. They were, I, but I didn't feel like they really captured. I, I and I felt like let me back up. I felt like the books and the articles I'd read and and the YouTube videos I'd seen, they talked a lot about the tactics of data engineering and they talked about a lot of the, um, you know the the what of data engineering, not the, the not the why and the how, right? So I think nobody had really taken a, a stab at like establishing data engineering as a field from first principles, for example. For you know what I'm talking about are. You know, nothing wrong with these types of books, but data engineering on, say, you know, a certain cloud or data engineering using certain tools, right? And these would be, and then I'd look at, okay, so if I type in what is data engineering, I'd typically get back articles like data engineering is the use of Spark and Hadoop and um, MapReduce and Python and SQL. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's like saying that, you know, the art of carpentry and, uh, you know, um, is it, simply, using uh you know uh you know certain tools you know hammers and drills and and so forth right that's how you it's how it's, those are tools that you use to build a house for example but that's not exactly i wouldn't say that that's construction work right <laughs> i mean it would be if you if you talk to a construction worker that way or or a general contractor or an architect about that's how you, you would build a house they would look at you like you're crazy and probably tell you to leave um but that's exactly how we've been talking about the field of data engineering. And I would say data science to, a, to the same degree. We're, we're so focused on the tools. We're so focused on, uh, you know, the, the, the tactics. We, we, we've never actually taken the time to consider what it is that this field is trying to do. What is this field? Again, from first principles, right? So that's why I wanted to write a book. Uh, so, you know, me and my co-author, Matt Housley, we were also running a data engineering um, you know, um, data architecture consulting firm. We, we've been doing that since like 2017, 2018. So we have a lot of experience, you know, both before we started our company as well as during it. I'm just seeing, I would say, a lot of teams being challenged by data engineering and not, you know, and I think jumping into the field and getting a lot of what I would say is pretty horrible advice based on these articles in this book, very uh, short-sighted advice. So I think we wrote the book in, in part to scratch our own itch, to, you know, take a stab at solving and explaining this, this, the problem of data engineering from first principles, as well as I think, you know, putting our, our stake in the ground in terms of what is data engineering, right? And, and um, you know, so I think that's why we wanted to write the book was simply that we felt that the field was, and the topic was being grossly uh, misunderstood and, and addressed from, I think, a very dangerously short-sighted way. So uh, as the fields are evolving, do you think that would you like to extend the book or do you like to write another book, so let's say volume two, or do you have a plan to increase in some other volumes as well? I mean, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on data modeling. Um, in fact, uh, you know, early chapters of my book will be out on uh, online soon. So that's, you know, I think that's, I would say it's going to be more spinoffs of what that book, uh, you know, covered. I imagine at some point we'll be writing a second edition of it. Uh, but we, you know, we wrote the book to be viable and, and uh, relevant for five to 10 years. We weren't interested in writing a book that would be relevant for a year and then be forgotten about, right? I think there's a reason the book's been highly successful in that it it does strip away you know, a lot of the complexity. Um, you know, who was it? Bill Inman, uh, the guy, uh, father of data warehousing and considered actually the father of our modern industry. Uh, he... You know, he, he, you know, when I was writing my book, he, he gave me some really good advice, which I took to heart. Was, you know, if you're writing a book, don't talk about technology. The moment you start introducing technologies is the moment you start putting an expiration date on your book. And so what you really need to focus on is, um, you know, what are, what are the first principles of what you're trying to talk about? Uh, you know, so if, in our book, we, we mentioned technologies only by example and saying, you know, for a contemporary example, these are technologies, but this is probably going to change at some point. So, you know, so we didn't intend the book to be needed to be rewritten for a while. Now, that being said, you know, 
you know, I'm working on, I have, a, I have several books in the pipeline that I'll be working on as well as courses based upon, I think, areas that we talked about in the book that probably needed more explanation. For example, data modeling, I think we covered it in like maybe, you know, say six pages or some number that's pretty small relative to the ground that actually that topic deserves. Uh, same with, you know, topics like architecture and orchestration and so forth. And so, you know, we've already, you know, Matt and I've already started making notes on what we'd want to change in the second edition of the book. But as it sounds right now, I think the the main thing is just making sure people at least know that it, the book's there and that it's available for them to read and would definitely benefit their careers if they are interested in learning about data engineering. So, Thanks. I hope that this book should finish quickly and we shall have the opportunity to read it. So I just have no, <laughs> so I just have one additional question. That uh, <clears throat> what do you think as the key factors to become a good author? Um, I think so. The, I mean, if you back up and look at the art of writing itself, I think it's also a matter of understanding uh, that writing is very much a process of thinking, right? So. When you write, I can't think of a better tool to help clarify and shape your thoughts around a particular topic than writing. You know, I mean, I do a lot of podcasts, you know, I do a lot of coursework and stuff, and, and those are great. I think it helps you dive in, you know, if you're if you're out of a pyramid of, of knowledge, right? And, and this is like the deepest level you can get to of depth and breadth in a subject area. You know, probably topic talking about a topic, on, you know, on a video, on a podcast, it gets you to maybe even hear, right? But when you're when you're having to write about a, a topic, you know, maybe an article will get you this far because you're having to think about how you're constructing your thought, you know, that will fit the size of an article. Writing a book, on the other hand, means you you know you're, you're right having to write many many articles, but having to tie all those ideas together over a, you know sequentially throughout a book. And this is where I think a book is much, much different than writing a series of articles. So you have to keep a coherent thought, a coherent thread through the book. And this is fundamentally different than writing articles, making videos, writing um, you know, um, you know, tweets and so forth, right? I think that it's just the book is, I, I think, the, the only thing I've seen that really, I, I think, it, you know, it, it it just forces you to think at a much deeper level. And I think that's really hard for, to explain to people. Or I think it's easy to explain to people, but I think it's hard for people to appreciate like how much it forces you to think. Now, in terms of writing a book, um, tips, you know, tips for, you know, to be a successful author and so forth. I would say being a successful author is, uh, or just being an author in general, that's really a function of just putting in the time and being an author. Sounds easy enough. Uh, but it, it's a lot of work. I don't think most people could write a book, right? I think even with ChatGPT these days, I think people could go through the motions of writing a book. They could definitely make prompts and just have it write stuff. I've seen this happen. I mean, for example, there's several uh, knockoffs of my book on Amazon that say Fundamentals of Data Engineering. That's, that's the cover title. But I, I look at these samples of the book and I'm like, it's clear this person didn't think about this topic to the level we did. It's clear that they used ChatGPT to write most of the, the content. and so. You know, so I think as an author, the the act of writing and publishing versus the act of um, coherently just you know putting your thoughts down in a in a in a way that's tangible, sequential. Yeah, right. Like that's that to me is what what separates a lot of people from you know from being writers, you know, to being true authors, right? And then you know, success is really a function of a lot of luck in a lot of ways. Like you have to have timing of your idea landing with people. Like you have to have written a good book that resonates with people. You know, I mean, you have to have some luck with marketing as well. Um, and there's a lot of things that come into play. So like the art, art of like authoring a terrific book is only part of your challenge when you write a book. There's also the other factors that, you know, people have to like it, right? And so I'd say that when you're writing a book, um, beat up your ideas in public. That's what we did. You know, we had, you know, I, I post a lot of the ideas of the book early and often to uh, show people that, um, you know, uh, this is the idea. Feel free to beat it up, uh, you know, and that helps sharpen your thinking. Uh, and we had technical reviewers who I'd say were very, very vicious. And that's what exactly what you want. You know, you don't want people who are going to 
congratulate you and applaud you on every sentence you write. You want people who are going to beat the crap out of you, you know, who are going to challenge your way of thinking and make you feel like you're completely stupid. Um, cause that's, that's what you need. You don't need, you don't need people to treat you like a, you know, like you're a celebrity or treat you nice. So, I mean, that's the one thing I think is uh, often misunderstood when, with authoring is that you, you want to challenge your ideas and, and the other thing is you're going to challenge yourself because you're going to realize like what you, you think you know about a topic. Like I thought I knew about data engineering. I started writing a book on it and same with Matt. Like we realized we don't know the first thing about this. There's so much that we need to, you know, so much that we learned through the process. And so it's a, it's a huge learning experience too. And it's, it's probably the most humbling thing. If you, if you do it the right way, like I said, if you cheat nowadays and just use chat GPT to write your book, I think you're going to, you know, you'll write the book, but it's like, it's like cheating on a test or cheating on your homework. It's like you, you didn't learn anything. Right. So I think part of it is like how much you want to push yourself in this process too. That's, that's something I don't think that, you know, chat GPT is going to, you know, I think it's a good conversational agent, for example, for authors. And the reason I bring it up is I know everyone's going to use it for books. I use it for mine all the time, but I use it as a conversational agent to push my ideas into different directions, but I, I never use it to write one. It could never capture my writing style but two, Um, you know, I just think it's, you're, you're cheating yourself out of the experience of pushing yourself as a person. Right. So thanks. So thanks. Answers your question thanks, in a very long. So way. as we have <laughs> provided services to numerous reputed companies, what, uh, so what suggestions do you have for a startup with limited resources to initiate market research and achieve a return on investment? Uh, it's a pretty broad question, um, but let me take a stab at it. I, you know, I think in general for startups, uh, you know, it's, it, the, the the cliche is definitely find product market fit. Uh, it def I think that's definitely important. I've worked at a number of startups. Uh, some some failed, some succeeded, and so I have a lot of experience in this. So definitely definitely product market fit. Getting your you know nowadays I think it's a bit different than it used to be. Back in the day, it was all about you know getting logos and maybe not making money. Uh, you know nowadays making money is. But I always think you should always make money and find customers, but uh, that wasn't always the traditional advice you'd get from VCs and so forth. So, but with respect to data initiatives, which might be more interesting to your audience, right? Uh, you know, so you have limited resources, right? You have limited time, you have limited money. So I would say f figure out if you're going to, if, if data is going to be a part of your product, right? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, but the things I would focus on or, you know, where can data be applied either at a, at a fundamental product level? So the product is data driven, right? So talk about Uber before, but Uber is a data driven app. Like it literally is powered by data, right? This is versus maybe a startup that makes, I don't know, shoes or something like that and sells them online. Like that could be a startup. Uh, these are kind of different, different beasts. Uh, but I would say, early on, the data initiatives need to be focused on what's going to lead to customer success and outcomes that improve areas of revenue and customer retention and growth. That's my opinion, right? So we analytics needs to be focused on areas that are going to move the needle with respect to your customers. Um, you know, that's the only thing that matters at the end of the day is, uh, you know, creating a customer and keeping that customer, right? That's literally your job. That's always the job of a business, really. If you take Peter Drucker's version of a business, it's your business is there to create a customer, right? So early on, your data initiatives need to be honed in on the customer. Anything else, in my opinion, is a complete waste of time. So, so uh, I mean, as you have mentioned, that keeping the customers. So do you think that uh, studying on data would be helpful in these cases? Yeah, for sure. Right. So I think there's some areas you could look at. So the first thing is making sure you're, you, you're, you know, traditional stuff like funnel analysis, right? So we're, we're, we, you know, we have probably, uh, we have ways we're trying to, you know, acquire customers, right. And then all the way down to, to acquiring the customer. What's that funnel? Like what's the cost? What's the path? Simple things like conversion rates, so forth. Right. And again, this, this could be an e-commerce site. It could be a, a conversion could mean some sort of an action as well, not just a purchase, but it's the action you want to take that will, you know, 
convert somebody to a customer. I think defining what a customer is is also incredibly important, right? This is actually something that isn't done, um, I think, as explicitly as it needs to be. And how this starts manifesting itself is as your company grows, if you're lucky enough to grow and succeed, suddenly you have many definitions of a customer. Is a customer that some, has bought ever from you? Is a customer that some, is somebody that bought in the last 90 days, last six months, last week? Is it a prospect, right? What's a customer? I think it's a, it's a, so defining uh, these, these things too, like what's a sale, right? Uh, so if you're, if you're selling physical products, is, is a sale um, when you take the order, when it ships? Uh, if, you're if you're dealing with returns, for example, what's a sale? The, I've actually seen these differ in companies. Uh, the returns department isn't this, you know, it doesn't consider a sale to be the same thing as, uh, you know, maybe marketing. Right. So it's like, so you need to, you know, to establish and define what these things are and then can come up with a, you know, um, ways of tracking these things. I would say, you know, model your data early and often too, even if it's, uh, you know, implicitly, but in an informal way, but figure out, okay, so like, what's the flow of data, right? How do I set up, uh, you know, my data flows, my data model, uh, to capture all these types of events. So what, what grain are we capturing events for analytics say, and what grain are we, are we capturing data that could be used for, to build machine learning models, right? Um, if you're making machine learning models, what's the expected outcome of the machine learning model, right? Are we doing batch? We're we doing online and so forth, right? There's a number of things, but at the end of the day, just, I think having a thorough understanding of the business that you're creating. And, uh, I think setting up as chaotic as a startup can be thinking about processes in terms of like sequentially how does data flow from one step to the other right in, especially in applications um because this is the data you're going to be using for the analytics this is incredibly important and i think setting up a higher level model if you can of just what is a customer what is a sale you know what is success what are these key components and having that sort of conceptual model that impacts the application data model that impacts the analytical data model and machine learning data model, right? So if you can do that early, I think that also sets you up for better success, even if it's like an informal thing, just as I said, how we're going to do things as a business. Um, I mean, I, cause the opposite approach, if you just say, well, we'll just take orders and we'll just figure it out. That's also a form of a model, by the way, it's just going to be a very haphazard, uh, one that's going to be a bit chaotic. And then when you start, if you grow, if you're lucky enough to grow and, and succeed, um, your analytics is going to be kind of all over the place, right? So you had, you have, I would say like, be intentional about how you're treating data from day one and just know that data starts at the application, right? The application that you're building. So be intentional about the, you know, the, how you, how you intend to consume that maybe downstream, even if it's, you know, that may change, uh, which it always does in startup. So. So I, I, I just have one additional question that as a startup, their data will be very limited. Probably will be. So how to proceed with that? I mean, how to deal with this thing then? So it is a, it is a bottleneck. Yeah, and that's what I think where a lot of so you, your 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 model is going to be, uh, you know, so your data is going to be limited. Yeah, because you don't have a lot of you probably don't have a lot of interactions with your application yet, right? So one thing I'm a big fan of is just uh, doing scenarios and spreadsheets, keeping it pretty low fidelity. So make fake data, make up scenarios and scenario plans. Say okay, according to these scenarios, this is the expected outcome. Okay. So we'll start, you know, modeling for that. Right. So, uh, but don't, you know, I mean, you're, you're, so again, I think back to your point though, right. I think that what's kind of baked into this answer is your job again, is you'll create customers, right. So you can get more data. So how are you going to do that? Right. So it's kind of, it's, it's sort of this, uh, this, this flywheel effect where you're going to have to, you know, I think work with your team if you happen to have one, and figure that out. Like, how are you going to get more customers? And then, you know, you're going to, you're going to have hypothesis, you know, this is again, sort of lean startup thing. Like you're going to have a hypothesis, you're going to go test it out. Right. But along the way, you're kind of probably going to be tracking some sort of data, whether it's, I would suggest just doing it in a spreadsheet to start. You don't need to keep it any more uh, complex than that. But those are data points, right. That's going to inform, you know, kind of how your business evolves. So you can do this, you can do this implicitly, you can do this formally, or you can, uh, uh, or you can do this implicitly or formally, but either way you're doing it. Okay. Thanks, Professor, for sharing such insightful yeah. discussions. So we are on the verge of our, end of our today's session. 
so uh, i i just have two more questions with this that uh, these days many students from different fields are interested in data science i mean in different fields i mean it's not only in science background they are from different background but still they are coming because there are lots of job opportunities in this in this field as we mentioned it's a very sexy thing so what advice do you have for someone mm -hmm. starting in this journey for those students so how how they start their career in this direction yeah i can only give an american centric answer right i i i think that and what i've what i've learned is my career advice doesn't translate to a lot of places uh, so i you know I, I would say that in my advice, if you're getting into this career, just know why you're doing it. Are you doing it because it's the hot path that you're going to make a ton of money at, which I think actually is really hard these days for new graduates coming out of school. Uh, the, 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 the world's changed, uh, you know, in the past couple of years. It used to be you could you graduate from boot camp and get several job offers to be making six, you know, six figures in, you know, in American money pretty easily. And those days are gone. I, I know a lot of people who graduated from boot camps colleges right now or getting a job is really, really difficult and it's really discouraging. So I think you need to take a hard look at, you know, why you want to do this, right? Is it something that it's, it's just really motivating to you and you just love data for whatever weird reason, like I did when I was in school and it's just kind of the path that you knew you'd be doing, right? Like I, I always read, you know, data books and math books and stats and all this stuff. I mean, even I've been on my weekends, it's, you know, even as a, you know, you know, before my, my undergrad actually. Right. So, I mean, this is something I've just always been motivated by, but that's, I'm just wired differently. Right. This is something that I think it's just, it's just always been how I am. That's not everybody. So I think my, my answer is going to be a lot different, but I would say, you know, understand what your, what your path is, understand why you want to do this. Are you doing it because it's trendy or are you doing it because you like it? Um, they're going to be a lot more motivated and so you're going to be a lot more successful in this field if you're motivated because you like it and because you have an inherent interest in, in this in this field. If you're just doing it because it's a hot new career field and everyone tells you you need to get into it, including your parents, like that's probably not a great idea, right? Now you're doing it for other reasons and you're going to burn out when you realize how hard this field is. It is a hard field. I think it's easy to be the same as everybody else, right? To you know, know that know superficially the different machine learning approaches, for example, in data science and know different ways of visualizing data. Like that's all table stakes. That's all basics. Uh, I think, you know, for you to, to truly make an impact in the organization that hires you, for you to move up the ranks, you know, as a professional and for you to, you know, I think be happy about your own trajectory and want to put in the time to be to be better at it. Like that's that's just a different type of person. Right. But those are the kind of people that succeed in any career field. Or the ones that are just continuously learning and the ones that are motivated to, to, keep, to keep going. You know, so I think it, you need to understand, is that going to be you or you know, is it not going to be you? So that's. No, I just have one thing that, as you mentioned, because uh, one thing which I think is that uh, there are lots of advertisement by different institutions. They are saying that if you do this course six months or one year, then there, there will be a campusing job or I mean, this kind of advertisements are there. So this is so. So is this a trap and you know, students should not fall into this trap? No, nah, my, my advice is follow the money, right? I mean, there's always going to be somebody out there that wants you to pay them for, for something. Yeah, I run a business. I do exactly that. Uh, a lot of institutions, a lot of, uh, you know, schools and boot camps, you know, it's, it's no, it's no secret. A lot of these institutions are, pro are profit motive or profit motivated. Right. Just follow the money. Understand like what, you know, are these people doing it out of the goodness of their hearts or are they doing it because they want to make money? Right. And then I guess nothing wrong with that. Right. Everyone needs to make a living. Every every business is in business to create a customer, i.e. a new student and hopefully provide something of value to them in return. Right. So I think you just need to understand what's the value proposition being offered. Right. So I would look at the success rate of these institutions and, and ask, OK, um, you're going to charge me X. Um, what's my return on investment for this, right? What's your what's your job placement rate, for example? How successful are your students, say, one to five years after graduating from your institution? There are certain institutions, um, like IIT in India, for example, and then Harvard, Stanford, you know, all the Ivy League schools, where it's like 
it, it, you know, if, if you graduate from these institutions, it's a, it's a given that you're going to be finding work. At least it's like that's that's the expectation is you're going to get great work. You're part of the elites. Um, so but most people can't get in those institutions. Most people can't afford to go there. Right. That's just how it is. Right. You're talking about top single digit percentiles of just people. Right. And there's a lot of factors that contribute to people even getting consideration for these that I won't get into. But it has barely anything to do with how good you are. It has everything to do with the social ties you have and the money you can you can afford to pay. So it's like for the rest of it, though, you know, if you're talking state institutions, state government, you know, uh, state universities or government universities, um, at least in the states, you know, a lot of universities that are motivated by making money from students. Right. Because they know they can, they, you know, students can take out loans and the, the government, U.S. government backs them and so they're, they're paid either way. So they keep raising tuition. Uh, so, you know, a lot of that goes to, towards administrators and other costs that I'm, you know, I question the value of it. That's a different topic. Then you have boot camps whose sole motivation is to make money off of people. Right. So I think you just need to understand like what's in it for you, what's in it for them. Right. And you got to do that cold analysis too. Everyone's going to promise you, you can find work. But again, I know a lot of people coming out of boot camps these days, whether we're talking engineering data, whatever, they're having a hard time finding jobs because that, that, the job market isn't what it used to be. Right. So I would just say you need to be, need to be very concrete. Like you're in, when, you know, they're interviewing you to understand if you're going to be a good fit, you need to, I think, push back even harder and interview them to understand if this is a good use of your time and money. Um, cause I think an alternative to these approaches is just, uh, start attending local meetups in your area, start building your network of, of local practitioners, find mentors who are more senior than you. You know, build up your skills, build up your portfolio. And I think that may be as good of a way to get, you know, into the field as any. I mean, that's, that's how I... I self-learning. I, self-learning. If I see people, you know, as, as, as somebody who's hired, hired people, I mean, if I, see, if I see people who are self-learning, self-motivated, who are just going out there and busting the butt and showing up, you know, to meetups and events where, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, interact and they're, they're interacting with practitioners and trying to grow those skills. I, I know that person has motivation. You know, I've hired people like that before. I hired, you know, people from meetups who I just seen showing up for a couple of years and they wanted to break into industry. They were in academia. I'm like, yeah, I think you have what it takes. Like I just, you know, you presented at my meetups and you, I just know how you think and you're motivated and you, you learn and you got a good attitude. And I'll take a, I'll take a bet on that person, you know, and that's exactly what a boot camp is going to do anyway. That's going to teach you the, the skills over a compressed time period um, polish your resume up and t- tell you to go network with people. It's like, great. I can tell you that right now on this podcast for free. You go do that too. <laughs> so, you know, save yourself about 20 grand or whatever it is. And, you know, but the main thing that's going to get, make you successful at the end of the day is your network. That's, that's the sad truth of it. It's like your ability to function and grow your career, whether you're starting out or whether you're looking for your, your fifth job, job as a senior or as a principal, or as a manager, or as a director, that is entirely built on your network. It has nothing at all to do with, you know, uh, at a certain point of like, you know, how you did in casual competitions or how well you did, uh, what your GPA was after your first job, your GPA means absolutely nothing. Right. So I would say like, but it's always your first job. that's the hardest. Right. But I think at this day and age, it's about getting out there and hustling, showing up to events, meeting people, you know, Going into it with the exp- no expectations and don't be transactional. Don't go into thinking everyone's going to give you a job and they owe you a, a conversation, a job. But you got to you got to go in there and show that you're somebody who's, you know, um, you know, worth talking to and worth uh, potentially hiring at some point. But that just takes time building a reputation. So as data science uh, is a huge field now uh, with lots of advancements and applications. So is there any particular directions you think that which you I mean, will be relevant in the coming years. Um, there's the advice I would have given, but now that you know, I have AI in the picture, I don't know. Because um, <laughs> um, it's hard to understand what's going to be automated, right? I think uh, you know, at the time of recording this, uh, was it Devin came out from Cognition.ai, which is a, I think, a very interesting demo of the possibilities. Uh, Devin, you know, for the audience, it, it appears to be. Uh, they claim it's the first, the world's first software uh, AI or AI software developer, i.e., an AI that acts as a software developer. You just give it instructions; it'll just take the task and run with it. So, so I, you know, I I I don't know. I I really don't know at this point. I I, I a part of me thinks that 
there's um you know i'm trying to sift through this whole ai uh hype cycle that we're in right now are you like what's what's useful and what's um you know what's just hype right uh and so part of the success i would say of, of getting into data science is i think going into it with eyes wide open with that same lens of under of trying to figure out okay it's so like what's going to be useful and what's not right so class you know if we look at um you know data science the way it was taught before um you know gpt exploded on the scene you know it was all about deep learning and classical machine learning methods right and these were these are still extremely useful i think you need to understand i i, I joke that we're in a classical machine learning winter right now we're like all of a sudden everything is a large language model but large language models don't do a lot of the things that the classical approaches do right so you know uh like recommendation engines right and classification predictions um you know uh, regressions and all those sort of things they're still extremely valuable skills so you so they think you just need to know when to apply certain techniques uh to your field i would say learn how to leverage generative ai for your craft you know i would say learn to augment your career with chat gpt uh, maybe and at least for the time being, don't look at it as a threat, but look at it as a way you can enhance your career. But I would say the, the, the crux with ChatGPT and, and similar things is like, you might just want to type in, uh, you know, a question and, and it gives you an answer. And you're going to assume that that's the answer at face value. So I think like right now it's a, the ability to critically think through the answers that large language models provide you. I think that's going to be actually more important as a data scientist. Your job essentially is to be a critical thinker about your business and about your organization's problems as a data scientist. To me, that's the fundamental core of that field. But like with every field right now, if you can just type in a question and you get an answer, how much are you going to critically think about that answer? I would say this is what's going to separate you from everybody else again, is like your ability to put in the hard work and think and use your brain uh, and, you know, and maybe leverage large language models to creatively, um, you know, solve problems. I think that's sort of where everything's going. Um, but the idea is to just, you know, I guess the old approach of just, um, you know, with data science, you know, which is just like no Python, no SQL, no, you know, no, a few machine learning methods and visualization techniques and that'll make you a data scientist. Like that was never useful to begin with. I don't think. And it certainly is far less useful these days when you have a robot that can do a bunch of the stuff. Right. So it's learning to work with machines, um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, open source tools or large language models or other generative AI techniques. And Lord knows whatever comes next, uh, you know, and learning to work with the machines. I think it's, it's how you're going to be successful as a, as a new data scientist. The, the other part of it is I would say that, you know, you're going to get back to basics. And part of what that what that means is talking to the business, understanding the business's problems. So I think that the role of data, and I'm actually going to be giving a talk in this, um, you know, very soon in France, uh, you know, where I, I, the joke, the, 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 the talk is uh, jokingly titled data science is dead long live data engineering. But the, the notion I think is the usefulness of the, the term data science, I think it needs to go away. I think it, it's, we're, we're shoehorning too much stuff into the title of data science and not understanding what its actual value is supposed to bring. Right. Now it's an, it's an all encompassing term. And when you, when you mean everything to everybody, you mean nothing at the same time. And so I think it's about getting back to basics and understanding, okay, so how do we leverage data to, to improve, um, impacts that will move the needle for our business that at the end of the day is the only reason you should exist, whether you're a data scientist, data engineer, or so forth. Uh, but just to do data for its own sake, I think we've been, we've been fixated on that. So I think going forward. Another successful attribute of a data scientist is going to be, uh, you know, if you do away with the, if the word data and you just say domain expert who happens to use data to solve problems, this is also where it's going, right? This is actually how it worked back when I was um, you know, starting my career. Data wasn't the thing we talked about. It wasn't, oh, we were doing data. No, it's like you're helping to solve a sales problem. You're helping to solve a marketing problem. You're solving operations. So I think this is where it's going to come full circle. Again, because now you have a lot of capabilities at your hands you didn't even have a few years ago, right? Look at large language models and so forth. I think we're only at the beginning of a new era that we're fight we're trying to figure out in, in real time in, in terms of the impact of this. So you being closely aligned to the business, understanding the domain, understanding what stakeholders needs, um, 
you know, making friends with stakeholders, you know, being their ally. This is where everything's going. In my opinion, it never was about data in the first place. If, if you look at kind of fundamentally, uh, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, data ha just happened to be sexy at the same time, but it never, if you look at how we're trying to solve problems as a business, it, it was always about the problem first and about data second. It's never the reverse. Yeah, thanks. So I just so, have one additional question that, uh, as you mentioned, generative AI. So how do you think that uh, data science is going to enhance this? And I mean, what is your predictions about uh, about this in this direction? I don't know. I, I'm not a fan of, of <laughs> making too outlandish of a prediction, so I'll, I'll refrain from making predictions. But I think uh, I think it remains to be seen. I don't. I really don't know. I really don't know. I think that again, it's part of understanding like what's useful and what's hype, you know. But I, I you know, I honestly think we're about to enter the uh, trough of disillusionment with the uh, large language models and generative AI in general, right? I think there's been a lot of a lot of promise and probably a lot of over promise of these tools and techniques, but, but there's, there, there's some fantastic utility to it. Right. So I think it's, just, it, I don't know yet. I think, um, and it remains to be seen what, you know, uh, you know, AI, you know, autonomous AI software agents, you know, software developers do. I, I think that we're just at the very beginning. So I, I don't know. Long-term, I think what it means is you're going to be living next to machines. I think long-term, the inevitable consequence is you will be living next to machines. But that, that's that's a simple answer, right? Yeah. Thanks, but, Professor. So yeah. uh, thanks once again, Professor mm -hmm. Joseph, for joining with us today and uh, sharing your insightful uh, yeah. perspectives. So uh, looking forward to more talks on different <laughs> topics in the near future. Still then, have a nice day. Bye. Yeah, you too. Good. See you on.